Now it's time to talk Jacksonville Jaguars football on the RLADS Football Network at the RLADS Football YouTube channel. I'm your host, Greg DePama. And if we're talking Jacksonville Jags football, that means we're talking to John Osher of Jaguars.com. How's it going, John? Good, Greg. How are you, buddy? I'm doing good. Uh, thanks for doing this as usual, John. I know it's always a busy time of year, so we always appreciate your time. And um, this is uh, now where everybody, most of the teams are going into uh, skins and shirts kind of deal, uh, OTAs, mini camps, and everybody looks good now. Uh, but uh, just quickly, as far as uh, overall, what you felt and what you got as far as a rhythm from the fans, how they felt uh, for uh, the way the Jaguars conducted their draft this season. Uh, the draft, it, it, uh, I think good. It was a, uh... Overall, the, the reviews were positive. Uh, Brian Thomas, first-round pick, obviously uh, a guy people had heard of, fans like that. Uh, Mason Smith, the second-round pick, I think fans were unsure at first uh, what that pick was about because he had had the injury. He had a torn ACL uh, in 2022, came back a little slow this year. I think once they figured out uh, – what it meant, meaning, hey, this is a guy who, when healthy, can be dominant. Uh, I think they warmed up to that one. So uh, the draft made sense. Jerry and Jones, third round. Uh, Jerry and Jones, forgive me. Uh, third round makes sense. Uh, he, he fits into the nickel, maybe pushes for outside corner. Uh, so those three, I think, sort of stood out. Uh, okay. The rest of it, you know, after you get past the third round, especially in this draft, uh, which wasn't particularly deep. Uh, you're probably hoping for uh, guys to make the team first year, contribute a little, and then see what happens once they get a year under their belt. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, go through the picks. And by the way, later on, before I let you go, I'm going to get your take on the schedule. Um, and I want to remind everybody, too, out there that is watching. Uh, I'm not sure if you've already ordered the R Lads. Draft Guide. It's available, of course. This has been available for the past uh, couple of months at rlads.com. And even though the draft is over, this is still a great time to get it because you know exactly where to find your scouting reports for your players, for your team, especially Jacksonville. So check this out. It's already available. And the Draft Review Guide, this is last year's Draft Review Guide. The new one's coming out in a few weeks. That's the reason I'm having the discussion with John because I'm going to take uh, a lot of what John's input is and use that uh, for uh, my report on Jacksonville in the draft review guide. So again, check that out at rlabs.com and make sure to subscribe here on the channel uh, for not just Jacksonville, Jacksonville Jaguars football, but uh, football uh, content for all 32 NFL teams and college football. Okay. So uh, let us start with Brian Thomas. Matter of fact, one of the things I did notice before we go into these, the players one by one, John is I always try to look at, is there like a, uh, you know, I'm sure you do too. Like what's the headline? What's the, what, what is it that actually looks like uh, there was a plan? Um, or not. Uh, sometimes it's just accidental. But uh, nine total players, six from the SEC, uh, two Big 12, one ACC. Uh, so all power uh, uh, programs. Um, I also noticed that as far as some of the more uh, uh, positions where re that require speed, wide receiver, running back, corner, um, all of these players are really fast. Uh, Thomas 4-3, Jerry and Jones 4-3, Prince 4-3, Robinson 4-4. Uh, so I did notice that as well. Um, those are a couple of things, including, of course, having three LSU players uh, in the first five picks and two defensive tackles who played together last year. So uh, pretty cool the way Jacksonville put their uh, draft together. Did you uh, notice anything this year compared to uh, years past that is, is giving you – um, maybe a, a way to say, hey, you know, I've got a pattern developing here now. Well, I think the pattern is uh, Trent Valky's a, a, a Bill Parcells disciple, believes in that approach. And uh, Trent is going to pick big school, uh, typically. I mean, there's exceptions, but sure. uh, big school uh, increases your odds. He plays the percentages, meaning if you play at a big school, it increases your odds once you get in the NFL. If you fit prototypes, if you fit measurables, and I think what you said is is exactly right. The the fast guys are really fast. The big guys, uh, Mason Smith, he, he looks like a prototypical, uh, you know, Jeffrey Simmons type of defensive tackle. You can you can look at him and envision him playing in the NFL. You say this guy's put on this earth to do that. 
Uh, so I think fitting measurables, fitting prototypes, big school, uh, SEC, all these things increase your percentages of working out. And I think that sort of defines what Trent Baalke's drafts are about. If you, uh, It's the old Bill Parcells thing. If you draft exceptions, pretty soon you have a team of exceptions, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Trent's gone away from that a little bit. I'm not saying he it, it, it is an absolute, uh, you know, will never do anything else. But that f- really fits this year. They wanted to get bigger, stronger, faster. They're bigger, stronger, faster after the draft if the guys can play, which we don't know until training camp. And even, you know, in a couple of years. Okay. Um, yeah, because I was just, uh, while you were talking, I was just, uh, let me take a look at the last couple of drafts myself. And, boy, uh, th- that's exactly what we saw even last year. Um, it looks like most of the picks early on, especially all Power 5 programs again, Oklahoma, Penn State, Auburn, Florida, the year before that, 2022, Georgia, Utah, Kentucky, uh, year before that, Clemson, Georgia. So yeah, uh, a ton of uh, this. Just uh, and again, no different GMs. I get that as we go further down the road, but it does seem to be a little bit of a um, uh, trend there. Okay, so let's start with Thomas, the one of uh, three LSU Tigers that were brought on board, um, and 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 everybody, of course, is going to put Marvin Harrison in a league by himself. But uh, I think Thomas is still one of those three or four wide receivers in this draft that has the ability three or four years from now to possibly be the best receiver in this draft. That's how talented he is. Yeah. And if you talk to draft analysts, which I guess we fall into that category, but in talking (laughs) to many people for the draft, it was the top three. And then a lot of people thought that out of the other group, Brian Thomas had the best chance to come in. And I don't think he's going to be a one this year, but he had the skill set to eventually be a number one wide receiver to be a big time player. Uh, in the in the couple OTA practices we've seen rookie minicamp, he looks at you know he can run. He makes things that uh, other guys have to work to do what he does easily, which is what you want out of your first round pick. Yep. He looks smooth. He can catch. Athletic, fast. Uh, you know he has a combination. He can get deep, but you also look at him and say this guy can high point the ball in situations. So. All the physical stuff is there. You hear that the game comes easy to him. I think for him, it'll be a case, you know, how fast does he get professional where he takes advantage of all his skills? Uh, That is the question for 99% of the guys who come into the league. So I think that's, uh, it it appears that the only thing to hold him back is himself, which there's no reason to think it will. So I think it's a good pick. Yeah, and he also has the good ability to go down the field, be a downfield threat. They've already added Gabe Davis. So uh, those are some big-time weapons that Trevor Lawrence has now. Uh, sometimes teams have one guy, uh, especially right. with the starting group. Looks like Jacksonville has two guys that opposing defenses are going to have to be concerned with going deep. Well, yeah, uh, going deep, and I think the advantage he has. you know, This team, you asked really about the fans. Fans look at the history of this team drafting wide receiver, and it's not good. You know, uh, the best they ever drafted was Justin Blackman. Uh, his career ran off the rails for off the field reasons. Uh, beyond that, they really haven't. They've taken flyers in first round on guys, and it really worked out. Uh, my impression is I, I didn't cover all those guys, but most of them came in having to be the guy. Okay. Uh, Evan Evan Ingram plays for this team. Christian Kirk plays for this team. Travis Etienne plays for this team, and uh, Gabe Davis plays for this team. Uh, All of those guys can factor into the passing game. Uh, I mean, uh, Brian Thomas Jr. does not have to come in and catch 95 balls for 1,400 yards next year. If he and Gabe Davis strain the defense, if he's a receiver in his first year that makes defenses pay attention to him, he can be very effective catching 700 yards with the balls. Yeah. And I can do more than that, but uh, this offense with Kirk Ingram, think back to Doug Peterson's offenses in Philly. It's designed to be a four receiver, 850 yard, all eight touchdown group. They're fine. If that works, they can all complement each other. If Gabe Davis fits into that and makes that equation happen. I'm sorry. uh, Brian Thomas, Jr. Okay. You know, 
if Ryan Thomas Jr. comes in and, and fits into that, then for the first year, he's a good pick. Yeah, and uh, since we're, we're, we don't really need to come back to wide receiver, let's just uh, – I want your opinion on a couple of things here because once you get past the top three, who's the four? And you've got Parker Washington, of course, late round draft pick last year. And you've got, I, I see there on the depth chart, this is the RLS.com depth chart. Uh, they've got posted uh, four college free agents. Um, now, any of those separate or are these just kind of, okay, flyers on all of them, they've all got talent, or is there one out of those four that we need to keep an eye on the most? Oh, the college free agents? Correct. Yeah, I, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. Okay, I'm, I'm, well. I'm, I'm exaggerating that. Uh, <laughs> I I'm, I'm searching for the name here. Um, Joshua. Uh, Cephas. Yeah. Yep. And I was drawing a blank out of the group. He's the guy who looks like an NFL player. Okay. He's, he's a little, uh, he's not big. You know, um, he, he's, I would say skinny cause he's probably the, uh, thicker than I am, but he, uh, he strikes you that he needs to put on a little bulk. He certainly runs and has produced like a guy who can produce in the NFL. I hesitate with any UDFA to say they're going to come in and be the fourth guy. I and mean, that's, that's a big step considering the first round picks got to uh, develop to make an impact. So, but out of that group, Cephas is the guy that people are talking about. Uh, he'll be the training camp storyline to watch. There's some other guys too. Elijah Cooks, who made the team as a UDFA last year. Uh, really impressed. Seth Williams has looked very good. They're sort of uh, – they're Cephas with a couple of years of experience on Cephas, if you follow me. They're that developmental okay. UDFA-type guy. Uh, and then don't forget about uh, Devin Duvernay, who they brought in as a yeah. as a returner. Um, I would think he's the fifth with Washington having inside track on the fourth right now. Okay. With these guys we're talking about having a chance to uh, make them keep six. Yeah, by the way, uh, I do have, or our lads, the draft guy, does have a scouting report on Cephas as a potential seventh-round draft pick. So he is the guy that should stand out, a four-year starter. He was actually the Frisco Bowl MVP, had 56 career starts, and you can check out the rest of the scouting report if you yeah. purchase the draft guide. So Yeah, I mean, he's the guy out of the bunch who you would think they, draft, I mean, they signed with the idea that he could easily force them to keep six or be a, or be a practice squad guy. Uh, that's what cooks did last year. So they're always open to that wide receiver. Okay. Uh, let's stay on offense. And uh, with the next pick uh, Javon Foster in round four and Foster was a three-year starter seems to be more of a power player, but I think this was one of those offensive linemen that uh, when you went into the draft, you said, Hey, you know, th th there's some pretty interesting mid round uh, offensive lineman available like Foster, who, when you take a look at his resume in college, pretty impressive. Now, whether that translates or not, who knows, but to be able to get a kid like Foster who played in the SEC and had uh, a lot of production, uh, they got, uh, I would have to believe the Jags were uh, pretty happy about that. Yeah. I think you get your offensive lineman uh, one of two ways uh, every few years or, you know, you know Two out of three, two out of four years, you draft early. First, second round, you assume those guys are going to be starters. Yep. Along the lines, every every three or four years, you draft a couple fourth or fifth round that you see has a, some potential uh, to develop and then hope that one of those two guys, you know, I'm playing percentages here because that's what the draft is, hope that one of those develops into either a swing guy or maybe a starter. Foster feels very much like a guy who could do that. He, he he's a huge human being. He's got a lot of, uh, be, I mean, SEC experience. All those things are there. So I don't I don't think they obviously don't want to see him on the field this year. They hope that Cam Robinson, Anton Harrison, and Walker Little are their three. With Walker Little as the swing, so he's in a position where ideally a fourth round tackle is either the ninth active guy if they're worried about losing him or he or he's on the practice squad he's on there i don't say practice squad he'll be on the roster yeah you hope you never have to play him you hope he's a 17 game and active or playing this on special teams but uh he's in a good situation here because they don't want him to play if yeah. that makes any sense yes so 
Uh, there'll be no pressure on him. You can develop him. Phil Rosh is a good offensive line coach here. Uh, if you're a healthy line and a healthy franchise, you're bringing offensive linemen like this along. You're drafting with the idea that they can wait a year to play and then play once they're developed and they understand the NFL. Uh, this is their foray into that this year. Okay. And um, same question regarding uh, the free agent. I see one of them in there, and that's Stephen Jones. So, um, matter of fact, Stephen Jones' uh, scouting report is also sure. in the guide because he was a player that – uh, was potentially going to be drafted in the seventh round, a four-year starter, um, and played at Oregon um, uh, at, at tackle uh, for the first three years. Uh, so again, similar in a way like Foster, a lot of production, big you know, big program, that kind of stuff, and they were able to pick him up as a free agent. Yeah, he he's a guy who physically looks like he should be in the NFL. Uh, my understanding is he needs to play much more physically, uh, much stronger to make it in the NFL. Uh, I can't really pass judgment on that. He's They're wearing baseball caps in practice this week. So uh, it's hard to really tell what an offensive lineman is going to be. I have no feel for that. But um, he's a guy who wouldn't shock you at all to see him on the practice squad. Uh, you can probably get him there. Nobody drafted him. So uh, – he makes sense as a developmental guy, and if you sign five Stephen, you know, if you if, if you sign five of these guys over five years, maybe one of them sticks and, and you hit something. So I think that's the percentage there. Uh, but physically, he's a Trent Baalke guy. He looks the part. All right, now uh, the final offensive player that they drafted was a running back out of Texas, uh, Keelan Robinson. Uh, smaller size kid, kick return ability. So is that uh, the key reason they picked him? It was, his, again, the new rules. I Absolutely. Think, you know, yeah. yeah. So uh, when I said earlier uh, about not expecting much out of this draft past round four, I should say that with the caveat of they expect a lot out of this draft past round four on special teams. They really saw, I think they saw a relatively thin draft knowing that there wasn't going to be much sixth or seventh round that was going to impact your offense and defense. They drafted Cam Little, the kicker, who we'll talk about later, uh, and they drafted Robinson. They drafted Robinson because they believe you need two kick returners in this day yeah. and age. Uh, so I, I'd be very surprised if he's not uh, a major factor on that. He can do it. He's fast. He's got all that. Um, I almost hesitate to analyze much about him because I didn't even know what kick returns are going to look like yet. <laughs> so, and I, I think everybody's sort of waiting to see. Yeah, They believe that he'll fit what they're going to try to do. They, like most teams, have put a lot of time into figuring out what it's going to look like. What they came out with is they believe that you're going to need two back there so, so teams can't kick away from you. Uh, so they think he's going to be a big factor. Uh, we're going to talk a lot more, of course, in the next couple of months when uh, when we have you on to, to preview the season and go over camp and, 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 and battles and who's progressed and all that stuff. But since uh, this is the last offensive player, I'm going to ask you this uh, with the defense as well. Uh, is there anything else that the, you believe that the team needs to improve upon this offseason on offense? Now that, again, the draft is over. A lot of free agency is over. There's still players available in free agency. Yeah. Do you think that they're set now on offense, or you wouldn't be surprised if they added a, a you know, a, you know, a, a player who could be valuable to them somewhere on offense? Yeah, I'd be surprised if they do it before camp. Uh, often, I mean, and the only reason they do it in camp, I think, is is with an injury. They've got, like I, like I talked earlier, they're a big believer that you need eight offensive linemen in this day and age. Oh yeah, uh, at least seven. They feel like with Walker Little is a swing. They re-signed Tyler Shatley inside. They have a kid named Cooper Hodges, seventh-round pick last year inside. That kind of gets you to eight up there in their point of view. Uh, they like Tank Bigsby to back up Travis Etienne, even though he didn't do much last year. So, uh, I, you know, I'd be surprised if it's a name. I'd be surprised on offense if, if, if they're super active anywhere in terms of veterans. Okay. 
let's go ahead and switch on over to the defensive side. And we're going to start, first of all, with their uh, – talk about their top two uh, – well, let's talk about their two defensive tackle picks because uh, it's kind of uh, – they kind of go together. I mean, they played mm-hmm. together last year for LSU, just the one year, because Jefferson played, first of all, for West Virginia. Um, I, I know that the Jags struggled a little bit down the stretch last season in run defense. So I don't know if this is a big part of that. They got to get younger there. So talk a little bit about the differences between these two players. Yeah, I think they hope that they can be part of of the uh, of the defensive line wave. I mean, it, it, they definitely addressed this offseason – being stouter against the run, uh, which which went off the rails in the second half of last season. Not, not off the rails is, is strong, but it, it hurt them. Um, so they signed Eric Armstead with the idea, and they're moving to a four-man front. Uh, Devon Hamilton's coming back, uh, nose tackle. Armstead and Hamilton would be the main thrust into trying to get better against the run right now. Uh Mason Smith, Jefferson, uh, you would think are pieces that can give you 15, 20 plays, which again makes you stouter overall because those 15, 20 plays matter in this league. So uh, Jefferson is very much a nose tackle type. Uh, He's your space eater. He's he's your tough guy. There's video of him at at, at one of the bowl games uh, pulling an offensive lineman's helmet off. Nasty, stout, all that stuff that that they wanted more of. He fits that. As I said earlier, Mason Smith, um, he's a guy who, if, if he plays to potential, he's Pro Bowl, he's special type guy. Uh, now, I'm not going to put him in the Pro Bowl because there's a long way to go. But sure. physically, uh, he has the traits that if if they're right on him, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, he was very dominant when he first came into LSU as a true freshman. Hurts his ACL, comes back, not as dominant uh, in, in his year back. Um, but the traits are there that if he maximizes it, he's Jeffrey Simmons type guy. He, he is special, penetrate, all that stuff. Now, so many factors go into a defensive tackle being special. Yep. And I can't predict it, but those are the traits he has uh, working under Eric Armstead for a year. Uh, there's some comparisons there into the kind of player they can be. So uh, again, Eric Armstead's a high bar, but uh, you know, they like him The compliment Smith and Jefferson. If they both work out uh, again, it's the penetrating defensive tackle and it's the space eating defensive tackle there, you know, two completely different players, but you need them both. Yeah, and and again, that's something that we talked about when we were previewing the offseason. We were going over the changes with the coaching staff, and this is very important because there are a lot of – I know Jag fans, most of them understand this, but um, just to reiterate the point, when you change coordinators, sometimes there's not many changes, especially if it's in-house, but there are some changes as far as scheme that this team is going to go through and have already gone through this offseason. Yeah, it's uh, – they played a three, four, it was under Mike Caldwell. But if, if, if you think Todd Bowles is defenses, three, four, throwing a lot at you. Uh, that's what they were. Uh, they produced a lot of turnovers. They, they were good against the run for a while last year and then they weren't. Uh, so that's when the wheels kind of came off this year uh, under Ryan Nielsen, uh, Atlanta Falcons last year, uh, got a lot better under him. You call it a 4-3, it's probably not fair to call it an exact 4-3 in this day and age with everything so hybrid. But yeah. it's, it's the, if you have to choose a base, 4-3-4, four, four, but there's, you know, I think they think of it probably as more of a 4-2-5 with a lot going on in the back. I doubt they'll be in three linebackers very much. I think Foye Aluakon and Devin Lloyd will be the two linebackers with Muma coming in. Uh, so... It, it, it's more about the different roles of safeties and, and nickels and dimes that are going to differentiate this defense. But certainly they wanted to get more, uh, again, stouter. Arms, if, if you think about these guys healthy, Trayvon Walker, Josh Allen, Eric Armstead, Devon Hamilton, Roy Robertson, Harris, Mason Smith, um, 
they want dynamic, stout, really good players up front. If all those guys are as good as their names and healthy for 17 games, they're a really good front. We'll see how it goes. And maybe the one that we'll uh, have to keep an eye on is Lloyd. And we talked a lot about yeah. him on our last conversation. And he's going to be playing sort of – it looks like he's going to play a different role with the scheme. So, But he's got the talent. Yeah, I'm not sure what the scheme is. I mean, I'm not sure what his role is yet. I mean, yeah. It, he's a linebacker. They're talking about having him – I mean, I, my feel with Devin is – they're going to do everything they get they can to get him into chase into see ball chase ball, uh, and see quarterback go get the quarterback when we ask you to blitz. Uh, his only problem so far in the NFL has been sort of uh, not preparation but in play recognition. Uh, sometimes okay. against the RPO, he he'll jump at something he sees. In play reading it uh, has has hurt him sometimes. Um, okay. You know, but. When he's around the ball, when he's in the right position, he has special traits. So I think yep. their task is get him in the right position as much as possible. Well, duh, right? That's what all coaches' tasks are. <laughs> but unlocking Devin Lloyd, when you combine the guys I just listed off, uh, and you combine, if you assume Tyson Campbell's good, which I think he'll be back after an injury, uh, Devin Lloyd's the one guy who you know hasn't been special yet, has special traits. If he's special and those front guys are good, then they're a good defense. Uh, we just oh, haven't yeah. seen it. Okay. Uh, stick stick up front. Oh, and by the way, here's are just the, 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 the big differences that I noticed, and then we'll move on, from Nielsen coming in. And, and this shows you the huge difference. Last year, Jacksonville was number three in the NFL as far as playing zones, how often they played zone. Atlanta was th- third in the NFL and playing man uh, last year. That's a big difference. So that's how uh, different the scheme might be. Uh, Nielsen, as you mentioned, did improve their pass defense all the way to eighth in the NFL last year, and their sack total doubled from 21 to 42 at Atlanta with Nielsen there. So Yeah, sure- uh, and they brought in some personnel to help that, obviously. But, it, yeah, it, it's – it's uh, look, the Jaguars have two really good edge players, Josh Allen yes. and Trayvon Walker. Um if Armstead's healthy, which 10th year guy, you always concerned a little about that. If, if Armstead's healthy and playing, that gives you three front line guys on the front of the line. Uh, it's probably been since 17 or so where the Jags had that much talent up front. And they may not even have had as much, you know, in that. And those were great defenses. They have a chance, if all breaks right, to be really good up front this year. And then the other defender up front, they drafted with their final pick in round seven. It was Miles Cole. I mean, this guy is as uh, lengthy as you're going to get uh, in this draft. Not only is he six six, but he's got a long arms and a huge wingspan. Played Sun Belt for the first four years, and then uh, made uh, the the one starting season last year with Texas Tech. Um, and he was a player that uh, our lads actually thought could have gone as high as the fourth round. Yeah, I think this classifies as in what overall most people thought was a weak draft. You're sitting there at number seven, I mean, in the seventh round. Um, Do we bunt or do we swing? And I think you swing with this. And if it hits, then you've got a real fine. And I think they had already looked earlier. Like I said, they drafted Cam Little, the kicker. They had taken – couple of defensive backs uh deandre smith and uh um jari and jones to to address some stuff in the secondary and special teams they drafted robinson to address special teams so they felt like they had all the stuff they needed uh they don't need miles cole this year would they love it if over the first two or three years of his career he, he develops into something like what you're talking about absolutely so uh, take him in the seventh round so you don't have to sign him as a UDFA. And, but what you said is exactly right. The traits, um, you're always playing percentages in the seventh round. Uh, the traits of this guy, uh, sort of like Mason Smith, right? If yep. he works, the traits are there for special. And that's what the end of the draft's all about. Absolutely.
And then uh, one more player in uh, free agency following the draft the team signed that could have gone in round seven and is also scouting report, our ledge, got to get this guy because not only are the draft picks in there, but some of these college free agents they signed have scouting reports, including Andre Carter, who was a three-year starter, transferred from Western Michigan to Indiana. Uh, so that's a, a guy that uh, sticks out. We'll find out. It looks like it's going to be a very competitive group of players though when you take a look at that defensive front yeah my understanding uh, on carter it, it would be a little surprising if he's not at least on the practice squad and we, and we talk about practice squad this day and age most people uh, watching this are hardcore football fans so they get it practice squad is a much different assignment now than it was before covid if you're talking practice squad you're talking about a guy who could potentially be up uh at various times he's basically yep. a part of your team andre carter um has a chance to be in that group. It'd be a little surprising if he's not at least practice squad. We want to see what he can do second year guy, which are very important for roster building. Uh, You heard good things about him along those lines. And then, and then last year's draft, uh, mid round guys that need to make that, make that next step, Abdullah and Lacey. So are you, well, I mean, Lacey's been a little over criticized. Uh, he he was part of the rotation last year. He's never going to be sack guy that people notice. When they drafted him, they drafted him with the idea, hey, he can be in your top eight or nine. You need eight or nine good offensive linemen. I mean, I'm sorry, defensive linemen. Uh, and he took a step toward that. His, his rookie year was fine. Okay. Uh, wasn't great, but it was fine. Uh, Abdul is the guy really didn't get on the field last year in this scheme. Where does he fit? Uh, strong side backers, what they're talking about. Um, you know, it's a big year for him to sort of see if, okay, they drafted him into this defense last year. All of a sudden, no fault of his own. There's a new coordinator this year, a new scheme. Uh, a, a pure three, four edge rusher is probably what he's best at. How he fits in this, I, th- I think that's a storyline of training camp. And I don't know the answer. Uh, but it's certainly something that they would like to get production out of him, at least as a fourth rusher. Uh, we'll see. It's something to watch. Hard to tell this week with the baseball caps. Great. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> and, and the fact is that even though it's a new coaching staff, maybe this is – I would look at it as – well, I would always try to look at everything as a positive. But I would think that this would be a positive because, sure. again, Nielsen – knows if, if, if this is one of the better coaches knows how to coach the, as far as coaching defensive uh, linemen, especially the edge rushers. This is a guy that could help Abdullah and Carter and Lacey. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, I think they should be pretty excited about the switch. Yeah. It, it, it it's young talent. Uh, they've got three or four guys, guys that you just mentioned that, that you would think uh, they're pretty good in terms of frontline guys. They would love two or three of these guys we're talking about to step up and be really good members of rotation. But like last year, Dwan Smoot was sort of a complimentary player. He's moved on. Uh, because of an Achilles injury, he never quite reached what they hoped. Uh, so they need guys really to sort of be better complimentary players was the case last year. Because, again, their edges had 27 sacks between them. Allen and Walker were outstanding. Uh, they just didn't get much production anywhere else need to, you know, increase other place production 50-60% over what it was last year. All right. Now, uh, sticking on defense, uh, let's talk about the the, uh, the corners that they brought in. Uh, we've already mentioned them a few times. Jones from Florida State and Prince from Ole Miss, both with 4-3 speed. Uh, Jones has five years of starting experience. He's a guy that most people would believe would be a slot guy, but we'll see. Um, and, 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 and the past defense <clears throat> actually has uh, struggled, uh, the last couple of years, uh, at Jacksonville. And so adding a couple of DBs, uh, in the draft, uh, that was a no brainer. Of course, they also added in free agency. So w- what do you think about these two kids and what they think about them? Well, Jordan Jones, uh, he's been a little criticized or wondered about among fans. Well, he was a nickel at Florida state, uh, and you take a nickel in the third round. My thought on that is he was nickel in a really good Florida State defense. Yes. Uh, to me, the league is trending toward 
outside is outside and nickel is nickel and nickel's a starting position in this day and age. Oh, so yeah. I, I think they drafted Jari and Jones. My thought is with that idea, I'm not saying he can't go uh, eventually uh, beat out Darby on the outside and then move inside. Maybe that's a deal. I think it's a lot to ask for a rookie. Uh, so I think they drafted him with the idea that nickel is its own position. And I guess nickel is one of those positions that you, you may not value in the off season, but if you don't have a guy who can play there, you sure value it in week eight. So uh, I think that's what they drafted him was about. Prince, I think is realistically more, let's get him on special teams right now. He can really run. He can really cover. And then let's see where he fits into a, into the cornerback room. There's some guys they've drafted in the past, Monteric Brown, some more depth like that. Uh, where Prince fits in, uh, can he come in and be the fourth or fifth this year? I think they're hoping he can. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned special teams because when you take a look at their scouting reports, well, Jones makes a lot of sense. He's a press guy, press experience. They're going to turn us to a press team, or at least that's what you're thinking. And then you take a look at um, Prince. That's the exact opposite. He's scouted to be a zone guy. So maybe it's, hey, you know what? We like him for special teams first. We can try to figure out the rest later. And who knows? I mean, corners can play safety not today's in today's day and age. So um, I'm sure they've got a plan for him. Um, but uh, I thought that was interesting. But it, again, the Jones one, I think, is the really, obviously not just because he's third round, but um, I've seen a lot of tape on him. And I, I think Jags fans should be excited about him. I think he's going to be a really good addition. So Yeah, it, it, they love him. Um, he's a... It, He's a fourth, uh, fifth year senior. Oh yeah, uh, a lot of experience. Um, there's a little bit of a win now mode here in Jacksonville uh, with the way that they, they went about free agency. Uh, to me, you draft a, a very experienced, uh, you know, 23, 24 year old guy coming in. You expect that to be more ready than if you were drafting a kid who was, you know, second year out. Uh, so I think he's, I think they hope he's plug and play factoring in the secondary immediately. And uh, when you draft that level of college experience, uh, you don't expect him to be developing in four years. And then the final player uh, to talk about is the place kicker that you mentioned, Cam Little from Arkansas, who, yes, has a scouting report. There's only, I think, six maybe uh, special teams uh, special teams kickers who are um, who have reports on them in the draft guide, and Little is one of them. So uh, they're going to hope Little wins the job? Yeah, I think it's his job to lose. Um, you know, in this day and age with the practice squad, it's a little easier to keep a safety net kicker. You can keep two around. I would think they probably do that. Uh, they certainly hope that he wins the job. He's got leg talent. He, he, the joke around here, he looks like he's about 14 years old. He, he, he he's a small kid. Uh, yeah. Special teams coach went out to scout him, bang the table for him, loves him, thought he was the best kicker in the draft. Uh, I don't know exactly what to say about a kicker to make it interesting for your readers or, or, or your <laughs> viewers, except that they really think that with the new kickoff rules, being able to put the ball at certain spots matters. Accuracy yeah. matters in, in, on kickoff. They think he has that. They also think he can obviously place kick. They think he has range. Uh, so it would be surprising when you draft a kicker if he's not your guy because you sure. don't want to take it. So I would think that happens. Haven't really seen enough of it in two OTAs we've been able to view. Haven't really seen enough to comment on him uh, beyond that. And even though he looks, uh, doesn't, I mean, you wouldn't think of it looking at him like he's not the Mevis kid, but the, he could kiss 60 yards. That's what they say. Yeah. So he's got a powerful leg. A lot of leg see. talent, which, which yeah. again, you would expect a kid taken in the draft to have oh, yeah. uh, the leg talent because you can find kickers who are accurate after the draft. Are there any, and we said, we, I asked you this on offense. So would you say that there would be a, a spot at all on defense uh, that you think that they might be looking at uh, regarding free agency? Uh, what do you think they're done? They could conceivably, they already did it a little bit with corners. They picked up uh, some veterans a couple of weeks ago, Edmonds. Uh, so they already sort of made their move 
to give them veteran options in case these young guys don't quite fit in case training camp, you know, you get into camp and you just sort of get a feel for, Hey, this guy doesn't do this quite well. We need X. They gave themselves numbers and viable options in the secondary. Uh, they haven't really done that at edge rusher. Uh, Travis Gibson is a guy they got from Tennessee. They, they, they like his potential as the third guy. Edge rusher is the one spot that you could see either early season, if they feel like they're not getting enough uh, complimentary play after, after Trayvon and Josh. People talk about that, that edge rusher spot as a possibility for that. Uh, okay. I think even with Trevor Lawrence's contract being up, I think there'll be money for a move left in case they need it. Trent Baalke likes to do that. That's the spot that will be talked about. Um, I don't know that they do it before camp because I think that they will continue to look at camp. You know, I think they'll still try to look at their roster and say, what exactly do we need? And, and this gives like we saw talk, we mentioned before, this gives a great opportunity for someone like Abdullah uh, to, Take 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 that job and run with it. Um, Absolutely, and I'm sure that's exactly what they're hoping for. Okay, uh, so uh, let's uh, talk about let's just wrap up the college free agent part. So I've got Cephas, Jones, and Carter looking like the three uh, top uh, college free agents they signed after the draft. I know we didn't go through much uh, some of these other guys on defense, but uh, a Proctor. I believe he's maybe another yeah. player, isn't he? Yeah, he was a combine and a senior bowl guy. Safety yeah. from Ohio State. He, again, with, with with college free agents, you look for stuff that makes them stand out. In fact, he went to the combine. Physically, he can do it. When you when you watch him, and the little I've watched him, he looks like a kid who, who belongs in the NFL. Uh, so he's a guy to watch in, in, a, in training camp as well. Everybody else, uh, look – Usually your UDFAs, often they don't come out of the list that we're talking about on video right after the draft. You know, you know it, it it sort of darts at a board. But to yeah. me, those guys, Cephas, Proctor, Carter, and uh, Jones, kid from Oregon, those are the guys that make sense to watch. They have the traits. They have a line on their resume that makes them worth watching. And Proctor uh, has a write-up uh, because he's a fifth round, potentially fifth to seventh round grade is what Arledge has him and a three-year starter, uh, as you mentioned, from Ohio State. So, yeah, again, draft guide has uh, not just the draft picks, but three of the, of the uh, free agency signed afterwards. As a matter of fact, the only player that does not have a write-up is Keelan Robinson. That is it. Okay. Um, now I want to ask you before we close up here, um, about uh, the schedule. So, uh, what what was the first impression that uh, that you had? Is there what what, what sticks out uh, most of all regarding the twenty twenty four schedule? Um, it starts tough. Uh, three, the, the first four games are all against teams who made the playoffs last year. Uh, it's it it's Miami, Cleveland, Houston. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the other one. Um. Uh, yeah. Oh, Miami, Cleveland, Buffalo, and Houston. Yeah, uh, Buffalo, which, which again, might be the toughest of the bunch if one of the others isn't the toughest of the bunch. And then you have Indy, also a winning team last year in week five. Uh, so, look, every schedule in the NFL is hard, so I don't spend that much time breaking it down saying, oh, boy, this stretch is going to be brutal because by the time you get to week seven, everything changes. But uh, that early part, you know, it – if you're asleep at the wheel, if, if you're not, if, if you don't come out strong, every one of those teams, if you don't play well, can beat you. Uh, I also think then you've got London. There's back-to-back London. They went 2-0 in London last year. They feel like London should be an advantage for this team. But then you come back after London. I think it starts in week nine with a stretch where you've got four NFC teams, all of whom are good. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, Philadelphia, Green Bay, Minnesota, and Detroit all coming out of that London thing before you've even got to a buy. So uh, when I look at this, I think the Lions are going to be good. I think the Packers might want oh, to yeah. be that four. I mean, they're ascending. Yep. Philadelphia, you don't quite know what they are, but I kind of trust they're going to be good. And then every time that, you know, every time league think thinks that Minnesota's down, <laughs> they wind up being – 
11 and six or better. Right. I mean, in that kind of there. So I, that stretch uh, it, on paper, if the Jags can get to their buy within a couple of games, they have a chance at the end to reel people back in. They play four of their last six in the AFC South, but getting there, it, if you're a schedule guy, which again, I'm, I'm really not, but on paper, based on last year, getting to week 12 still in it, uh, that's the task because it, it's on paper a very tough schedule. You got Houston sitting there, um, you know, it, those first four, and then that second four that I talked about, uh, you know, it's, it's a tough schedule. But you know what? The guy you talk to from Houston is talking about their tough schedule. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. within the division, they're all pretty close to the same. Uh, but the stretches to me are September and then right after the bye. I mean, and then right after London. Yeah, because like you said, once they get out after the bye, uh, and I think it's the way uh, the schedule should be, is where you play uh, within your division late. Yeah. And so, as you mentioned, four of the last six in the division. And, you know, it's possible the Jets and the Raiders, if they play like last year, those are winnable games. So. Sure. But that was last year. That's why I'm right. with you. I don't really go into the schedule, except, hey, when's the bye? Do they have London? What's the prime time? That's the only thing that really concerns me um, because the whole thing of predicting schedules is is ridiculous. Yeah, so, it's, it's uh, as you are, I'm sure. I'm asked every year how tough is it. But, well, it's tough based on the opponents and where they are, which you already kind of knew in January. Yes. Where they put the games is, is a little bit, you know, Jaguars fans, like every fan, every fan thinks the league uh, hiked him up and was against him on the schedule. Jaguars fans are mad about X, Y, Z. To <laughs> me, uh, you know, it, it, usually good teams make hard schedules look manageable. Bad teams make easy schedules look brutal. So, and they, they play well in London, right? Jacksonville, that's like a home yeah, away they, from home. Uh, Germany, they beat, wherever. They, they beat Atlanta and they, they beat Buffalo last year. So the Buffalo game is one of their better wins. So yeah, they usually play where play well there. This year, there the quirk is they're playing back to back again. Uh, they were the first team ever to do that last year. So you know, logically, you would think they have at least a preparation edge of knowing how to handle that. So yeah in a league where everything's decided on, you know, seven points or less, one little edge matters. Maybe that's their little edge. And their opponent uh, divisions are going to be AFC East and NFC North. Correct. Yes. Right. Which are, are which are tough, but you know, guess what? It's pro football. Yeah. <laughs> Just go out, take care of business. Right. If you think you're a good team and everything will take care of itself. Right. And it's your thing. You follow along up that brutal early schedule. Start hot, win three or four. All of a sudden, you feel like you're on top of the world. So that you know, this conversation analyzing the schedule changes so much. Oh yeah. Every Sunday, once the previous week's games are over, yeah. that it's it, it's folly to try to break it down at this point. But it's fun to do as well. And then uh, also just want to remind everybody, you have uh, the Wednesday, if it's still the same, you have the Wednesday uh, Huddle Up podcast? Yes, yes. That's with uh, Bucky Brooks of NFL Media. And then I do a weekly Ozone podcast, uh, weekly during the season, uh, bi-weekly maybe during the off season, where I talk to an individual Jags player. We sit down and get inside their heads a little bit. So it's always fun. John, it's always fun talking about the Jags with you here, and I appreciate it as always, and I can't wait to talk to you around training camp preseason, if, if for any reason, just because that means we're that much closer to the start of the season. <laughs> no so, doubt. Thanks, John. Greg, thank you, buddy. You got it.